what I'm going to try and do today is um, give you just a basic background overview from a technical perspective. I, th I think this is more of a more technical audience than I'm uh, than I've been presenting to. So we'll kind of gloss over some of that, assuming that you've got a better understanding of the basics. Um, and then I think any point of, uh, in time, we can entertain questions and conversation. Uh, if it feels like it's deviating too much from the from the flow, we'll say let's tackle that at the end. But please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or or to bring up topics for discussion as we go. I'd like this to be as conversational as we can manage it. So artificial intelligence has been around for a while, uh, 1950s. Uh, Many branches of artificial intelligence have have been somewhat isolated from one another over the years. One of the characteristics of AI research is it's a really broad net. And so you would have people working on computer vision. They would go to their own conferences. They would go to publish in their own journeys. There was not a lot of cross-pollination. So one of the things that is beginning to happen has already happened and is amplifying with generative AI technologies, transformer models, and a lot of the, the, the background information are allowing advances across the field of artificial intelligence. And so taking and either bundling these technologies or even upending old rule-based approaches to artificial intelligence and adopting uh, this more advanced transformer model um, approach has led to advances across the spectrum. GPT um, as an application is what everyone has been talking about. And um, there are some other big names in the industry, but from a general standpoint, generative AI is about creating new digital content and do doing so with natural language. So using natural language queries, this overcomes some of the limitations that you all have Siri or, oh, I'm always cautious to say the out loud the names <laughs> might activate everyone's <laughs> devices, um, or Alexa. And if you've used those before, those are voice driven, but they're, they're somewhat constrained in their lexicon. You have to fo follow their prescribed method of saying the commands in a particular order. And it's quite often confused, doesn't quite understand what you're saying. Generative AI interprets natural language queries much more generously and much more fluently. So large language models um, as a component of generative AI. Um, large language models are giant statistical arrays of information about relationships between nodes and bits of information. So uh, when these, these applications are being developed, these, these large models are being developed, large corpus of data, text data, image data, audio data is uh, parsed by these neural networks. The neural networks allow for parallel processing of huge amounts of information. But what it's doing as it's processing is it's scanning the information and and establishing connections between tokens, which it's easier to actually think of just words. Uh, tokens are often words, but they're, they slice up words sometimes. They're a little bit smaller than actual word count, but you can think of it as a word. And it, in a given sentence, it's going to scan through that sentence and begin to establish numerical relationships in an array for all of the words that occur in that given sentence. And that doesn't mean a whole lot within a single sentence. But when you start to process hundreds of thousands and millions and billions of words, what starts to happen is the interrelationship starts to form uh, clusters of information that are related to one another. And they're actually represented in a large vector array. In, you can imagine it almost in 3D space that you've got clusters of information that are related to one another linguistically that are all that form this giant model of language so what happens is when you when you put a query in first it, it uses its understanding of language that it developed through the model to be able to understand what you intend but then it uses your language to find patterns in that giant model 
and then begin to reproduce new information. It's not copying and pasting bits of old information, but it's using the patterns to produce new information. So if it was trained on visual data and you had all of Leonardo da Vinci's artwork and it was scanned in and then also encoded training process with descriptions, verbal descriptions of the style and the characteristics, the visual characteristics. Then when you use descriptive words that describe visual characteristics or you use da Vinci as a keyword, it goes and finds all the visual patterns that are associated with a da Vinci painting. And it creates, according to what you asked, you can say a puppy dog in the style of Leonardo da Vinci. So it knows what a puppy dog looks like from its understanding of patterns. And it knows what da Vinci's style looks like. It's not copying pixels from digitized paintings by Leonardo da Vinci. It's, it's adhering to its understanding of the patterns. It's a rule, we, we think of old AI as rule following and new AI is more of rule discovery. It's pattern discovery. And it uses those patterns to reproduce new digital content. So, there are some uh, common applications. ChatGPT, there's a company called Anthropic that is actually a split off from OpenAI. Uh, some of the employees didn't agree with the precautions that AI, that they they wanted more precautions than OpenAI was, was implementing. So they created their own company. Uh, the, you have the, the large language model that we talked about, and then you have an application that uses that model to deliver services, uh, chatbot. So in the case of OpenAI, we've got ChatGPT, which relies on GPT-4 or GPT-3.5. Claude is the application um, from Anthropic. Google has Copilot, used to be Bing. Um, and sorry, did I say Google? Microsoft. Microsoft has Copilot. Google has Gemini, used to be Bard. Um, and this... This is why I have to create new slides like every other week because they keep changing what they call them. Um, but it's, it is useful to know that the large language model itself, sometimes they're named the same thing, but the application continuously, uh, it, I, say, I can't even say the same things that I used to say. Application stays pretty stable usually. Um, Chat GPT has been Chat GPT from the beginning. The models that are upgraded in the background add different capacity. And ChatGPT, when it started, didn't have the ability to use images as prompts, for example. But now they've upgraded the model to 4V for vision, and now it has additional capabilities. Uh, there are competing products, and also Meta has taken the approach of open sourcing. I'll put air quotes around open sourcing because it's not like a traditional open source bit of code. Um, but it is free to use um, for acceptable purposes. Um, and that includes, Llama has made a lot of progress on making these models smaller so you can run them locally. They're not as performant as the bigger models, but there are a lot of activities that don't require the, the, the high-end model to be um, supportive of, of productive use. So other than that, We've got these models and these open-ended chatbots. Then we've got an unending array of new applications that are built on top of generative AI. And there are a lot of specialized applications. Um, and if you're in data science, then you, you probably are going to be doing a lot of code manipulation. Well, please try again. And, <laughs> and so, see, it was a little late. It heard me earlier. Um, <laughs> so um, one of the things that is the most having the greatest impact on productivity is AI support for coding. And this takes different forms. Um, there's GitHub Copilot, which was one of the first and is actually one of the best developed. Um, this draws on open AI technology, but if you haven't used it, um, we're all 
becoming more used to things like spell check, autocomplete. Those are actually AI applications working in the background to, to help us be more productive. If you give that steroids and think about being in a coding environment, um, when you start typing code, it will anticipate what you're doing. If you're naming a function, it will quite often populate all of the code to, to build that function. And even more impressive in some cases, well, so one of the first things I did was take code and say, please document this code, please, please add comments. And just went through the entire code and went back and created descriptive comments. That was impressive, but then you can invert that, put in a comment and it will write the code. And so it, it learns as you're going, it, it creates inter, it, it's contextual. It, it sees what you've done before and, and modifies what it's doing as, as you move forward. Um, and these are all applications that employ generative AI to support um, coding. There's, there's a rich development environment around Python in particular. So backing up a little bit, why does all of this matter? Um, there are international, national, kind of federal level, state level um, statements, acts, guidelines, requirements that are, be, that are evolving. Um, this is from October of last year, an executive order on responsible AI innovation, establishing guidelines and principles um, for federal use of artificial intelligence. And uh, within Virginia, in September, there was an executive directive on AI that had a specific section for education to ensure competitive AI training while preventing misuse in classrooms, largely focused on K-12 in its implementation, but it has implications for higher ed as well. Uh, another reason to pay attention to this, um, in, in addition to regulatory concerns that we're going to have to figure out how to respond to, is um, this is anticipated to have a huge impact on the workforce. And so Gartner's estimate by 2026, more than 80% of enterprises will have used generative AI APIs, models, and or deployed applications in production environments. Um, and that is also, there are also statistics then about um, how much generative AI is likely to change different disciplines and how important the use of generative AI will be to different disciplines. Um, this is a little bit hard to see, but this is research from McKinsey. Um, and this is really to show the difference before and after generative AI. Before generative AI is all in the dotted lines. And this is an array of uh, performance, areas of performance, creativity, coordination, lo logical reasoning, natural language generation. And this was asking experts to identify when would this technology achieve human level performance? And you can see that the estimates went all the way up past 2070 previously. They did the same exact survey post chat GPT and in more recent uh, estimates, nothing goes beyond 2040. So there's been a massive acceleration of anticipated capacity in these technologies. And this curve is appearing to be an exponential curve as, as the, the advances build on advances. So the change is happening very rapidly. I think one of the things to pay attention to is there is so much hype around this technology. And in many ways, what I've been trying to recommend is in spite of the hype, there's something there. We can't ignore it just because there's so much hype. Because if you have a choice between succumbing to the hype or putting your head in the sand, somewhere in the middle is, is the right answer. Um, we've got to get our heads wrapped around what, this, what the implications are and what responsible use looks like um, in, in different scenarios. Uh, this is more McKinsey research. Um, so what does it look like? Um, these are prompts put into mid-journey, a, a generative AI image generator. And just with natural language um, prompts, a vegan Buddha bowl, a woodblock, woodblock print, or a GQ cover photo of Abraham Lincoln, um, 
these, these are generated from the patterns learned by this model. Um, and this technology is becoming more and more impressive and advanced. This is a recent uh, version where I just typed college student um, crossing campus in the rain. And it is becoming so realistic that it's, it will soon be undetectable. So there are serious implications um, for society to consider what the, what the impact is, what controls there are. Detection um, is, is a big question. We'll talk a little bit about that in an academic environment, but, um, but the, the genie's out of the bottle. <laughs> this is not going to be turned off or prevented. And so we have to figure out how to, how to deal with this. So I'm gonna try here, there's some examples. If these don't work, we can just jump on. But this is um, the two examples. I'm only gonna play the second one. But in the first one in about a year ago, I, I was able to use Eleven Labs technology and I created a voice clone of myself. And it took 45 minutes of, well, no, 30 minutes, sorry, 30 minutes of audio to train the model. And it was okay. It was okay. The second one, this one was created later, and this isn't even the most recent version. And let's see if it plays here. I recently uploaded a short 45 second recording into a system called Plate, and it created an instant voice clone. The instant clone is not as accurate as their higher quality version, but it is still surprisingly good. So that was generated with a 30 second clip of my voice. So um, the, the technology advances so quickly that at this point you can upload a 30 second video clip and, and it, will, um, it will generate. So this is, this is just a normal video of me. My name is Dale Pike and I work at Virginia Tech. At Virginia Tech, we've been talking a lot about generative AI and its implications for higher education. I can take Hi. that video and... Hello, my name is Dale Pike and I work by Virginia Tech. By Virginia Tech hebben we veel gesproken over generatieve AI and the implications ervan for het hoger onderwijs. Or I can speak Hi. Chinese. Was your Dale Pike zij Fujini Ali Gong Da Xue Gong Zuo. 我们一直在讨论生成式人工智能及其对高等教育的影响. So it's not only cloning my voice, but it also changes the movement of my mouth to match the, the new language. And, and it's because this is an avatar that's generated that requires you to sit still. The newer version can do full motion and you can have clones created that are avatars that can say whatever you type into the system. So potential applications for individuals uh, to translate their materials into different languages or, or um, other uses, but we, I think it's easier for us to imagine all the nefarious uses that this technology can be put to. And the deep fakes concern um, is significant. Can you- Hello, hi. That's a good question. I don't, I don't think so, um, but, but I, uh, that's a fascinating question. question. Can you do speech to Braille? Yeah, yeah that, that's... I'm thinking, you know, some of the difficulties that we have with... Uh, yeah. Some students and... Right. Disability. Uh, I'll, I'll look into that because that's, that's, that's a really fascinating idea. So let's go back to chatbots. Chatbots are kind of the, the um, wild card here in terms of there are advances in other types of technologies that we're used to, but chatbots represent an open-ended, omni-use kind of technology. And as the technology advances, it will become more and more like a personal assistant. Um, one of the things that can be helpful to think about is if everyone had an intern, if you had an intern, what kinds of things would you assign an intern to do? And likely it would be repetitive tasks. Likely you, you wouldn't necessarily say, write and publish this research paper for me. Um, 
if it was unless they were a super intern, but still, even even so, you would you would want to check it. You would want to fact check things. You would make sure that the voice was appropriate. You would have them working on earlier stages of the process than as opposed to just producing a final product. That's a good rule of thumb to think about the most effective and impactful uses of this technology is as a supporter of process rather than a producer of product. And um, there are ways to interact with these tools through prompts that are more effective or less effective. When you first start using the technology, it's almost certain that you're gonna use it like Google. You're gonna put in search queries, just like you're used to for um, web searches with Google. You will get a certain uh, level of response that will be impressive, but you will also see that responses tend to be somewhat flat. They tend to be, they, they can be error prone. It, it's always error prone. I think, and one of the characteristics, the reason to think of it like an intern is you need to always be fact checking and, and making sure that what it says is valid. Um, but in terms of um, how to use the, the technology, paying attention to the fact that it's contextual is very important. You can say, ask it to do something. And then if it doesn't quite do what you want it to do, ask it to fix it. And it has a memory of within the conversation that allows you to refer to your earlier points and to continue to either refine or build upon what you've asked it to work on. And so um, if you're working on an, uh, developing a complex outline, you can say, type a complex outline and you'll get a certain amount of results. It's, it's, answers are usually about the same length every time. That's how it's programmed to respond. But if you said, um, create an outline, and then you go to step two and say, flesh out idea one, and go flesh out idea two, flesh out idea three, and you follow sort of the threads of your outline, you, you will end up with a much more comprehensive result, but you, because you're taking advantage of the context, and um, you're not expecting a one-shot um, capability. In addition to text prompting, you can also do image prompting. So this is an image I uploaded with parking signs uh, from Southern California. And my prompt is, it's currently 10.01 a.m. on Wednesday. When can I park here next? And so it walks through and reads the signs and comes up with recommendations saying, given this information, your next opportunity to park here on a Wednesday would be after one. However, if it's a school day, you'll need to wait until after four. If you park after four, you have a one hour parking window until six. So this is not so practical on my laptop computer, but I can do this on my phone. So if I'm traveling and, or this could be in a, a foreign language, it could be you know like this, a very complex, and I have to make a quick decision as to whether I can park there. Uh, real time support with visual input um, is one of the things that is, available with some of these applications now, but is evolving with how quickly it responds and how comprehensive its understanding is. This one is another interesting take. I just uploaded this line drawing of a political cartoon and my prompt was explain. So it says this cartoon illustrates a humorous juxtaposition. There's a character that looks like a salt shaker standing on a, form, a platform with a banner reading slugs for salt. And below the platform, there are slugs. Um, down at the bottom, this cartoon can be a metaphorical representation of situations where individuals or groups unknowingly support causes or entities detrimental to their well being. And so, this I use this one because when you understand technically what's happening, this really is just autocomplete on steroids but it's a little bit difficult to reconcile that simplistic notion of autocomplete on steroids with the capacity to do this level of analysis from, from a line drawing. Uh, the capacity, there are surprising capacities in uh, the large scale modeling that's happened within these models. So there are a number of potential use cases um, that, and really the use case generation is 
only limited by our imagination. That's one of the things that makes it difficult to get started is this is so open-ended and there, there's not a menu with four buttons that you choose to get started. It's, it's just, what, what do you wanna ask it to do? Its capabilities are inconsistent. If you imagine that somehow you could map all of its capabilities into a histogram, you would have a very rough histogram of capacity with some being super impressive and others being really idiotic, not able to do much at all. And that sort of, if you drew a line to follow that histogram, that jagged edge is part of what makes it difficult to figure out how to put this into reliable practice. My recommendation is that this, in its open-ended format, is not ready for prime time yet. This is like an advanced alpha of, I believe, what's coming. However, it's, it's capable enough that when you start working with it you, you, it, you can start to have epiphanies about where it fits and where it doesn't fit. And I think that's the opportunity we have right now is to get our heads wrapped around where this fits and where it doesn't fit, how we might be able to leverage it in our professional practice, um, and what are the guardrails we need to put up against the risks and the, the concerns that, that, are, that surround the use of this technology. Um, there are concerns about its uh, cost. It's a very expensive technology to produce and to deliver. And so if we were, there are schools, University of Michigan is a perfect example, um, implemented this technology across the entire campus, gave everyone access to GPT-4 and um, also had API level access in the background. Tremendous opportunity, but that is that costs the University of Michigan roughly $250,000 per month to deliver that service. And so it's nearly impossible to consider how would you do that? They, they have other sources of funding. It's research associated. They've got other things that they've done, but just considering the price tag, um, when you don't have a, a fully demonstrated use case, um, it's really difficult to figure out how to provision this technology responsibly because it's so expensive. We, we can't just jack up fees and tuition to pay for something that at this point is still speculative in, in terms of where its actual impact is going to be. Now, that being said, I think we have a responsibility to figure out how to put safe and reliable tools into the hands of faculty and students and staff. Um, we're still wrestling with that, I think, um, as an institution. I'm just curious in terms of thinking about, you know, what we do provide faculty and things like that and tools, is that is that a lot more than say what we do for the software like Office and things like that? It's like I'm, I don't even know. It's it's um, it's in the same neighborhood of things like uh, Canvas, for example. Mm -hmm. That's about uh, that's in the same neighborhood of what we pay for Canvas on on. Well, actually, no, no, sorry, sorry, it is not. It's an orders of magnitude difference. So two hundred fifty thousand dollars a month. We don't spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year on campus. So, so if I'm comparing it to the annual expenditures, there's nothing that we license that's even close to that. Um, but, you know, I I think it it sort of just changes the the landscape in a way that I think is going to force us to come to terms with how much education costs and what does it mean to have the most reliable tools. This is one of the first technologies that was not incubated in academia. Um, this, this is now obviously the people who developed this were part of academ academia, but the labs are commercial labs and they're developed um, in with commercial goals in mind. And that changes the dynamic a little bit from platform technologies that we're used to integrating at an enterprise level that often were created through academic research. So I assume Michigan got rid of 10 administrators. Yeah, that's over yeah, that's five. I, that's five, maybe it's five. No, I, so I've done the R studio has copilot built into it. If you have a GitHub copilot account, which took me a week to get and 
initially they wanted to charge me, but then it's free because I publish stuff on GitHub. Is the university going to support any of that? I, I think we have to. Um, I, I think there's a compound problem there in that we, uh, the I, IT hasn't approved the use of GitHub. So we have um, alter, alternatives that are in place. So we need to work out licensing um, issues. But I think the, the bottom line is we don't have any formal or official support for any generative AI other than Microsoft Copilot, which is sort of, it, it uses GPT-4, and it, it's it's a good way to start exploring it, but it's not integrated into um, any coding environments. It's not, it's not GitHub Copilot, or um, that's so confusing because Microsoft calls all of their AI Copilot now. So it's uh, really tricky to, to tease apart. Um, the short answer to your question is no, we don't have any <laughs> provisioned tools that are available yet. Um, what I hope is, as awareness builds and demand builds, we have the opportunity to explore how, what's the most effective way to deliver these tools? Which tools make sense to consider as a campus-wide license? Um, and are we willing to pay for it? Are we willing to figure out a, a reasonable cost and, and pay for it? Um, which tools are going to be departmental? Which tools are course-related tools? My primary concern is for the instructional use of these tools. And I would love to be able to have a, a menu of options that you could plug into Canvas and give access to your students during the course. And, and then it's provisioned and deprovisioned. Figuring out how to pay for that um, is still a, a challenge. Well, I think we're going to have a problem with the kids who can afford it yep. and the kids who cannot afford it. Yep, no. I, I absolutely think that is one of the biggest challenges. Um, access to this will differentiate your experience, um, both in the learning and in the, the working world. Those who are the most familiar with this technology will be stronger candidates for, for their positions than those who don't have access and can't develop the skill sets. So I don't think it's an option, but I think it, there's... There, it is a really tough problem for us that I think we have to solve. Um, and I think we have to try and solve it together, um, which is not always something we do a very good job at. <laughs> but, do, you, do you have any idea how many students are currently paying a monthly fee for, for ChatGPT4? I have something that like 25 bucks a month. Like that. Yeah, it's a 20, there's a $20 version, a $30 version. Um, but the, I would say, um, uh, there's no way to know. Um, from feedback from students, one of the interesting things about trying to gauge use is that um, surveys of students and surveys of faculty report that roughly 40 to 50% of people report using this technology on a regular basis. But there is a lot of concern that that's underreported because people want to know, well, do you think it's okay for me to use this? And if you think it's okay for me to use this, I'm going to tell you, yeah, I've been using it. I've had this even in faculty conversations where we start, this is a while ago, start the conversation and ask about people's experience with it. And everyone looks at each other like, hey, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And then we, we further say, we're encouraging faculty to use this. We're trying to build out resources. Oh yeah, well, when I used it, <laughs> it, it becomes evident that it's not a socially unacceptable thing and and you 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 get better reporting on it, but it's really tricky ultimately to know um i i think i think one of the challenges is that the free versions of this technology are the least secure so the data that you're putting into this it, right now we only have options on campus for using public data um, no moderate risk and no high risk data options have been approved. And so depending on where you draw that line from, from a research standpoint, we need to have safe and secure environments to be able to, to um, explore the use of this. And right now we don't, we don't have officially provisioned options. So um, this is a high priority, I think for the university at a time when there are lots of other competing high priorities. Um, and 
And uh, that's partly why I'm trying to build awareness so that we can have informed conversations about the costs and the benefits of, of this technology because there's really not an easy button to, to solve these problems. Um, yeah, let me, people won't voluntarily use a system that they don't trust. And so ultimately as a community, we have to make sure that as we implement, implement these technologies, we do so in a safe and responsible way and a transparent way because AI in particular is susceptible to conspiracy theories. And if you roll out AI and don't tell people that you've rolled out AI and it becomes known that you rolled out AI or you're using it for particular decisions, there's a lot of potential for backlash. Um, and so one of the responsible AI principles I think we need to embrace is transparency, where we're documenting everywhere that we're using this technology and being very open about what it's used for and what's what it's not. Um, a lot of feedback from science scientists in different research studies about how much it will impact science um, and, and the, the work that scientists do. Right now, my recommendations are we need to understand it better on an individual and collective basis. We need to set ground rules and boundaries for what acceptable use looks like. Um, commit effort and resources, again, individually and collectively. Um, rinse and repeat because the technology continues to evolve. And every time it takes a leap forward, the implications of, the, of, of its use change as well. So academic integrity, the undergraduate auto honor code has a lot of things already about using material that you didn't create and representing it as your own work. Um, so far, the, the decision has been, we don't need a new honor code. Um, the principles still apply. And um, that actually, again, not sure what how accurate the reporting is, but if, if our surveys are accurate, student use is lagging in, per, in terms of the percentage of students who are using it actively that uh, compared to faculty exploration, which is not what I would have anticipated. But again, it could be that people are not completely honest in saying what they're using or not using. They're lying through their teeth. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right. So recommendations for faculty, become familiar with the tools, Consider the honor code. Avoid being drawn into a confrontational mindset. This is this is a tricky one because if you see this tool only as a cheating tool, um, then you're going to react accordingly. And I I think I think it will create confrontation that that isn't productive in the long run. That doesn't mean we have we don't have to figure things out in terms of how to how to encourage appropriate use. Um, but I don't, there's a, there's a lot of attention being given to um, detection of AI. There are tools that purport to detect AI content. Um, we, in, in, in our test testing, have determined that, the, that it's not reliable enough to put into practice. There are enough false positives um, in, its, in its results um, that 80%, 85% accuracy is just not acceptable when you consider what the implications are for that 15%. And there's some evidence that those who are indicated for um, use the false positive recipients quite often are international students. And the way that they write follows a somewhat formulaic pattern that quite often triggers the, the detection and indicates that it was generated by AI. Plus, if you use translators, that's AI. If you use um, Grammarly and you do too many, accept too many of its suggestions, that will be triggered as AI content. And so there, there's, there's really not a great way to just put in place a safety net that will catch all inappropriate use. And so um, figuring out how we talk to students about this um, setting setting clear expectations for students um, and having conversations about what, what those implications are. Um, we also need to explore whether there are parts of our curriculum are, or the way we deliver instruction that need to be modified as a result of this. 
some of the most challenging large enrollment classes that use a high stakes multiple choice exam and they allow you to take it on Canvas. That is just temptation galore for using ChatGPT. There are applications, and, and I don't usually talk about this a lot because it ends up feeling like fear mongering. You can subscribe to an application that's a Chrome plugin for $9.99 a month that will load when you load a Canvas exam, there will be a little button by each one of the questions that say, answer this question. And it will pop up and tell you what the right answer is. If it says short essay, it'll write the right response. And you can speed run a quiz um, using this technology. My experience is that it's not super reliable, but that will change as well. Um, and so, Again, I want to avoid the fear mongering or the, the confrontation, but we also have to be realistic about what the implications of this are for assessment and how we respond to it uh, is still an open question. Does the lock screen feature? To uh, some, yeah, um, if, if you're doing it locally, especially, you can use Respondus Lockdown okay. Browser and that would prevent the use of these JavaScript plugins and stuff like that. Um, Shouldn't yeah. we just assume students are using it because they're using it and, you know, they start the training in high school and yeah. middle school and, and then just, we should have expectations that there are no grammar mistakes in the papers they submitted and things like that. You know, it's, it's fascinating because one of the strategies that you can employ is just assume that it's there and then build your curriculum so that it goes above, it builds on the capacity. But then if people don't have access to it, you're disadvantaging those that don't have access to it. And so, so again, there's not an easy answer. I think philosophically, that's what we have to collectively do is begin to rethink what, what does it mean to assess this course when everyone has access to these tools? Um, but it's not an easy answer. Is the, is the, the co-pilot in Bing is built around chat GPT-4. It is, Which yeah. is pretty sophisticated. Yep. And it's free. It is. I mean, it um, might be limited in terms of a 40 page paper or something. Right. Like that. Well, and, and the way that, yeah, it's it's limited in terms of the, the scope of each response. And um, it's it doesn't have all the same capabilities as if you pay for license. You can actually license Copilot Pro, I think they call it, um, and pay $30 a month and get access to, to uh, more features. But the free version is very capable. Yeah, it's very good. And the same yeah. with the you know, submit something, draw a picture. It yeah. comes out pretty slick. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So um, I'm just okay. going to, yeah. So that, I guess, <clears throat> how feasible would you think it, it would be to produce a model, uh, like, locally within the campus using our resources and implementing those within curriculum with access available to all students within the program? Yeah, I think I, so, so let me answer the question in two ways. Um, one is development of a large language model that is um, capable of competing with the most capable models is out of the reach of any academic institution. Um, the amount of computing resources that are necessary for building the model um, and then fine tuning the model and running the model um, are just out of, even the most advanced research labs, these are um, multi-million and even approaching billion dollar exercises to, to, to build these models. That being said, there is a lot of progress on um, making smaller models and some of the open source models. And one of the most interesting developments is an approach that's called a agentic AI, where you identify multiple agents that may be tied to different models of different capability. And then you build an interface that pulls on the right level for the, for the task. Um, so the short answer to your question is, even if it's not building our own LLM, I think we have to have some kind of a safe to access local model that's then fine tuned and, and trained on the kinds of material to give access like, like you're talking. I do think that's going to have to be a part of our future. The other challenge though, is that having the talent to do that is 
it, it is currently a challenge. Um, our IT staff um, don't have that skill set, and our research faculty in the labs are pointed in a different direction. Um, and so, uh, so again, uh, I think that's the direction we have to go. We just have to figure out how to do it. I'm just going to leave this here. Well, well, if there are any additional questions, this is, you know, there are a lot of different versions of responsible AI, but these are some of the things I think we need to be paying attention to set up boundaries and guardrails and embrace the use of this technology in responsible ways. So any other questions or comments? Yes, so I'm assuming the LLM maybe not good at like solving mathematical questions. So maybe not be that helpful in math, physics, this kind of courses? So um, yes, out of the gate, if you're doing that histogram, usually calculations and mathematics are, are one of its weak points. But there are specialized applications that are being built that are trained specifically for mathematic purposes that, that, can, that, that are much more capable. Um, in fact, there are some really interesting projects going on that integrate Wolfram Alpha with LLM technology and use Wolfram as the back-end compute kind of capability and then bring that to the language interface that, that um, ChatGPT provides. Um, but you're right, um, it is currently one of the, the, the challenges. I guarantee that most of the R&D that's going on right now um, within these big companies is trying to shore up that capability. And um, so, so, yeah, we, I, I, it's, it, it is, that's one thing you can say about all of, you could identify a number of weaknesses of these technologies today. And quite often when people want to dismiss the technology, they'll pick on one of those weaknesses and say, well, you know, it's not, it's not accurate in its citations mm -hmm. or, or it's not very good at, at, at math, um, but all of those things will get better. And um, it, even before the models get better at those things, there are third-party applications that are built. And even if ChatGPT gives you fake citations when you ask for references, you go to these third-party applications and they are trained on scientific research and they, are, they give you nothing but completely accurate citations. And there's some really exciting potential for literature reviews. It, it, there's several packages that just feel like, feels like cheating. <laughs> and it, but when you step back, it's actually just helping you identify connections, helping you narrow your search and identify related research in ways that, that um, are going to be second nature um, for researchers moving forward but it's those specialized packages that have been deeply developed with additional material that's specialized for that purpose. So, so do you have a uh, starting point for the AI curious? Like, um, you know, here's some things to try with mean, make the video or something or. Yeah. You know, right. These sorts of things are. Yeah. So, um, so I think from, from an instructional standpoint, um, I think one of the things that that is it would be interesting is to take some of your exam questions and go into chat GPT and say, help me understand this, this question, the way you give it a prompt. Um, sometimes it'll just answer the question if you just paste the, the question in, but you can also say, don't give me the answer, but coach me through um, understanding how to answer this problem. Um, I, I suggest that in part because you'll get insight into how well this technology can answer your questions. Um, but, but it's also a way to start thinking about what might responsible use of this look like. Okay. Rather than just using it to answer questions, can we use it to tutor and to provide background information? Um, I think there are, there are a handful of use cases let me let me actually put together just a, a small list and share back with this this group. Um, but some things that are relatively mundane that I just feel like are the best in the world are if you're going to a conference and there's an agenda that they publish on one page of the conference. Um, copy the just go into your web browser, copy the HTML table that's there. Just go into ChatGPT and say reformat this and create an ICS file, a calendar file. 
and it, it will recalculate everything and pop out a calendar file that you can drop into Outlook. And now all the sessions are, are in your calendar. That kind of data repurposing, reformatting, uh, realigning, um, it, there's a practical use when you're going to a conference and you can have notifications on your phone. But um, it also starts you understanding the places where in your own work, in, in, in data manipulation, where, where is it help, would it be helpful to just have a, I don't have to write a Python script to, to, to do this data processing. I can ask the, the voice-driven interface to do it for me. Um, so that's, that's another area from a productivity standpoint that I think is really interesting to explore. For the online audience, if there are questions, please put them in the chat. I'm watching the chat. So I can is there any solution to the multiple choice problem? Um, B. I mean, yeah. we, I mean, we've built a lot around uh, large classes, online classes, yeah. all driven by multiple choice exams. Um, to be completely honest, I don't think so. Should we bring back the uh, oral exam? In some cases, that's exactly what people have done. Explain your answer. Um, I do think that I, I don't want to sound trite um, or like this is a simple thing to implement, but uh, moving away from high stakes, multiple choice exams and moving towards more formative assessments where what we're doing is checking in with students on a more frequent basis and the, the stakes are lower for those kinds of interactions is one strategy that's being recommended to, to avoid the catastrophe of, you know, 30% of your grade in the final exam, and you just have ChatGPT do it for you. Uh, Dale, this, uh, a lot of the technology, as I think you mentioned early on, behind uh, these models has been around for a very long time, but we weren't talking about this five years ago. What is the main technological advance that that uh, brings you here today, right? I mean, yeah. what is yeah. enabled them? Um, so the, the, the use of transformer models um, is probably the key technological change that's happened here. Um, and, that, and, and the transformer model, we, we already had neural networks yep. previous to that. Um, and, and we already have machine learning. We had all the building blocks of this. One of the differences of, of the, the transformer model is it's created the way to, I would say it's the transformer model com combined with um, GPU capacity development. So we have more computing capacity than ever. And now these strategies that used to be impractical and, and I'll say at a lower scale, um, there are some, some simulations you can look at online where um, you can play with versions of an LLM as it's going through its development process. And in the early stages, it produces gibberish. And there's this really interesting curve where it's a hockey stick. You, you, it's incapable, messy, not impressive at all. And then you reach a certain amount of volume of the data that's been processed. And suddenly there are these sort of magical jumps in its capacity. I think that's what's happened with the com combination of these new parallel uh, uh, structures to, to um, process the, the information and the compute capacity to do that on huge volumes. That's, that's created this hockey stick of capacity that suddenly moves beyond everything we've experienced with AI. Um, I, I think bundled into that is that um, these technologies, as I mentioned before, tend to be pattern discovery processes. Most previous AI was rule following processes. You had to define the choose your own adventure book and say, if they do this, then say that. And if you do this, they say that. You have to anticipate almost every outcome that, that you were trying to program into the system. These systems um, are largely, there, there's a um, DeepMind, um, which is now part of Google, developed a, a program to learn to play Go, which is you know one of the most complex games on the planet. Previously, they had done chess, and when they were trying to teach it how to play chess, they 
showed it games from masters and they created rules for each piece. When they got to um, the more advanced kind of model that we're using now, they just gave it a go board, created some basic parameters and said play. And it started playing go all by itself with some feedback, but mostly all by itself. And it was able to play millions and millions of games um, and in the process become much more proficient. They used it on video games. They, so it's this rule discovery, this pattern discovery process that is another component of why this, this um, yeah, was able to do that. Is the pattern discovery has been there for a long time as well. So right. it doesn't quite get the answer to my question. The computing power up by that, maybe. Well, some so, sort of so I think I think it's pattern discovery and volume. I think I think it's the there's and I don't think the researchers could exactly tell you where the the magic is in between the point where the outcomes are predictable mm -hmm. and you reach a certain volume and and it appears that there are surprising emergent outcomes that nobody anticipated there was a shift though in the processing of text data in the question john um recurrent neural networks long short-term memory models they had a problem with retaining a lot of context there was a limit to how much memory uh, you could have potentially the length of the text sequence in the process mm -hmm. managing gradient problems and all these things made it difficult to retain a lot of context throughout with the transformer they discovered the attention mechanism which is a different mechanism for so okay. moving context and memory through a sequence and allow them to train the models in parallel rather than a sequence that has to be done, had to be done sequentially. Now you have training in parallel, which increases the amount of data you can process and the speed with which you can train. And you can process much longer sequences. Like in regular neural, uh, neural networks for text, you would have to specify the length of the sequence and anything longer would just get chopped off like it didn't exist. That no longer happens, right? So you can process long sequences, you uh, maintain the context of the train parallel, which allows you to train faster on more data. And that was the, that was that that step change where you know it's just like in 2011, where image classification went from, yeah, it's kind of cool tools to oh, we let's prototype because now we're at the level that uh, we have reached such an accuracy that changes the game, and this is what happened here. So for 30 years, you know, we have better, better neural networks, but the underlying technology was with the exception maybe from the convolutional neural networks and mm -hmm. some recurrent neural networks was the same. And it was that attention mechanism that broke this open. And I always like to talk about the paper, you know, was one in 2017, I believe what it was, uh, over 130,000 citations, not a single theorem in that paper. It was just conjecture. Well, we think this should work and let's try this. And ah, the activation function, let's just try. Let's divide this and square root here, and oh, look what happens. And this is the basis for the transformer. Yeah. And now NVIDIA is one of the most valuable companies in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, which is a sign of the GPU. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes me think of the gold rush where they said, you know, sure, you might strike gold, but if you really want to make money, sell pickaxes and shovels. Um, right. And NVIDIA, NVIDIA is demonstrating that right now. Yeah. Right. I want to ask a, a practical question. Like, what kind of job do you think will be easily replaced by AI? So, I think it's, it's just, just to you. you. Um, I, I, I think that this has always been a concern with automation and what, what yeah. jobs are the most potentially affected. Yeah. Um, I yeah. don't, I, I do think there, when you start combining technologies like um, embodied AI or robotics with AI, um, I think that you have entire industries that are threatened. Right now, I would say anything that deals with um, simple cataloging of data or, or parsing of data or interacting with users around data is highly vulnerable. And that inter it interacts with some professions like the legal profession. Paralegals are likely to just completely go away um, because rather than having them take over all these tasks. There's a voice interface that, and access to data. Um, and, but I think that some of the um, areas that are the most susceptible are actually not entry-level positions, which is usually where we see the, the biggest impact. Um, higher level management positions and, and um, 
university administrators, you know. I, nah, they're not going away. On that note. Right. On that note. On that note. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, we'll leave it over. Thank you very much for your time. Okay.